So today is uh, February 11th, 2023, uh, and uh, this morning uh, I'd like to resume uh, a series that we began last uh, Saturday, uh, which uh, is on the nature of bodhisattvas. Last week we looked at, are bodhisattvas really real? Uh, today I'd like to look at the central uh, bodhisattva in Zen, uh, which is, uh, who is Manjushri Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva of Wisdom. Uh, we'll do a, a, a series, uh, this will be on Manjushri, then uh, of course next week we have the uh, Buddhist Parinirvana half day sitting. Is that right? Is it half day or all day? Do you remember? All day, all day sitting. Uh, and there'll be a Te show on the Buddhist Parinirvana, then we'll resume with a koan on Manjushri after that. Uh, and we'll both proceed from there, uh, maybe another koan on Manjushri or onto Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva and a koan connected with Avalokiteshvara. That's the plan. We'll see how close we come to actualizing it. So Manjushri, Bodhisattva of Wisdom, along with Kanon in Japan, also known as Kuan Yin in China, uh, Avalokiteshvara and Chenrezig in Tibet, the Bodhisattva of Compassion is Avalokiteshvara, and Samanta Bahadra, Bodhisattva of Compassionate Action, are the three archetypal Bodhisattvas of Zen. Manjushri, also known as Manju in, ja in Japan, is the patron of Zendos, and so he's primary. Uh, in Japan, the Buddha sits in the Buddha Hall, not in the Zendo. The Buddha presides where Dharma teachings, services, ceremonies, and teshos are presented. Manjushri, Bodhisattva of Wisdom, handles the Zendo, the realm of practice. He's often seated on a courageous lion. Uh, he may hold a scroll in one hand and a sword in the other. Sometimes he's a shaved head monk, free of all attachments and concerns. And sometimes he's a prince with long hair, flowing robes, and jewelry, a representation of our involvement with life from the ground of our innately royal nature. Manjushri's altar is not against the wall, like the Buddha's altar typically is, and it's not raised up high looking down on the room. Manju sits on a pillar-like altar in the center of the room, out among the sitters, for when self-centered distinctions fall away, there is absolute equality, each thing or being totally, impeccably itself. <coughs> From such an absolute perspective, the life of an ant and the life of an Einstein are of equal worth. And so the Bodhisattva of wisdom sits with us in absolute equality. Uh, the Toronto Zen Center, uh, if you've ever gone there for one of our Jataka Sashin, is set up like this with Manjushri on a lion, uh, it's a shaved head monk, on a pillar in the center of the room. Uh, the Vermont Zen Center in the Zendo has Manjushri sitting back to back with Samanta Bahadra. Uh, Manjushri on a lion, Samanta Bahadra on an elephant. Again, in the center of the very, very large Zendo. But of course, both these centers also have Buddha halls with Buddha altars, and that's where ceremonies and chanting services are held. When Manju swings the delusion-cutting sword, he is the power of active practice, cutting through delusive, dualistic thinking, which means cutting into one, not two. When the sword is held upright in his hand, unmoving, it is prajna, perfect wisdom's hair-blown sword, so-called because it is so sharp, prajna, our innate wisdom is so keen, no effort is required. Whatever is blown against it, whatever self-centered thought arises in you, instantly, even if it just drifts against the sword of Prajna, is sundered. These are powerful images of our own practice, really beautifully representing something we all know from ongoing practice, here visualized made concrete for us. In his left hand, Manjushri holds either a scroll or a lotus stem. 
On the open lotus flower is a scroll or book, and the scroll, if it's just a scroll he's holding, is itself the heart of perfect wisdom, our prajna paramita, whose own heart is form is only emptiness, emptiness only form. Form is no other than emptiness, emptiness no other than form. That is Manjushri's wisdom. Things naturally fall into place when Manjushri is around, and even Buddhas return to their original places. A koan point in Gateless Barrier, case 42, Manjushri and the young woman in Samadhi goes, once Manjushri went to a place where many Buddhas had assembled with the World Honored One. When he arrived, all the Buddhas had returned to their original places. Why? Why did they all return to their original places when Manjushri is going to appear? And where did they go? Where are their original places? Where are they? Aitken Roshi, in commenting on this case, says, when you get this, the rest of the case is going to be in the bag. Let me add, you will also find yourself in accord with Manjushri's fundamental wisdom. Where did all the Buddhas go and why? Here's a little verse I wrote back in 2009 as part of my ordination uh, process, a lay ordination with Dane and Roshi, Dane and Henry Roshi. Buds on the trees, buds on the trees, Manjushri is on his lion, all's well with the world. That's uh, kind of how it is when we get in touch with Manjushri. When Manjushri is on an altar with the Buddha, he's typically paired with Samantha Bahadra, who's also known in Jap Japan as Fugen. Manju on a lion represent, or presents uh, noble, courageous, essential wisdom or emptiness. That's Manju on a lion. Fugen on an elephant presents the unstoppably active compassion that arises from an experience of emptiness. Emptiness, of course, is not nihilistic. That would be a very shallow understanding of what emptiness means. Together, Manju and Fugen are the two arms of the Buddha, emptiness and compassion arising from it. In Tibet, Manjushri is sometimes known as Manju Gosha, the gentle-voiced one, and in some schools of Buddhism, his wisdom is seen as about learning, about strong intellect and clear intelligence, so he's sometimes shown with child attendance as his practice strengthens memory and makes the mind sharp and subtle, which are benefits when you're on a path of knowledge and learning. To help with this, Manjushri's mantra is Om A Ra Pa Sa Ni Di. In Zen, Manjushri embodies not simply a path of learning or knowledge, but of prajna, or fundamental non-dual wisdom. Original mind, vast emptiness, a knowing that is beyond all understanding. The Buddha, upon his great awakening, proclaimed wonder of wonders. All beings are Buddhas fully endowed with wisdom and virtue. When the Buddha sounds his lion's roar of absolute truth, Manjushri is not far away. Traditionally, he is not simply a bodhisattva, Manju, but one who long ago realized Buddhahood and then decided to stick around, to stay with us in our saha, or bearable, world and help others attain Buddhahood, or full realization of our own original nature. So he is known as the teacher of the past seven Buddhas here on this earth. He is known as Shakyamuni Buddha's teacher from this mythic perspective. Yamada Roshi, Aiken Roshi's teacher, writes, you might think it strange that a mere bodhisattva could be the teacher of Buddhas, but Manjushri can be taken as the symbol for the world of emptiness. No one has attained Buddhahood without experiencing this world of emptiness. Thus, Manjushri is seen as the one who teaches the Buddhas about that world. In actual fact, however, he was a disciple of Shakyamuni. That's his, in history, as far as we know. 
He is ranked as a great bodhisattva together with Avalokiteshvara, who would be Kanon in Japan, and Samanta Bahadra, as we've mentioned, who would be Fugen. Not surprisingly, as a bodhisattva of wisdom, Manjushri can take many forms. He might have long hair, like a youth or prince, or hair done up in five bunches, signifying the five wisdoms, or sport the shaved head of a monk. When he has long hair and jewelry, he appears as a noble and presents our own royal nature. When he is the sacred monk, as he's known, the sacred monk, he represents our immaculate, unconditioned mind, free of all worldly concerns. A note from Wikipedia on the five wisdoms goes, the five wisdoms are the five kinds of wisdom which appear when the mind is fully purified of disturbing emotions and mental obscurations, so that the natural or unconditioned mind appears. They are the wisdom of suchness, the Dharmakaya, bare, non-conceptualizing awareness of sunyata or emptiness, the universal substrat or substrata of the four other four, the absolute ground, two, the wisdom of mirror-like awareness devoid of all dualistic thought and ever united with its content as a mirror with its reflections, three, the wisdom of awareness of sameness, which perceives the sameness, the commonality of all dharmas, all phenomena. Through this wisdom, a Buddha, a Buddha sees beyond all superficial differentiations and perceives the fundamental of all things as emptiness. Such undifferentiation gives rise to equality for all beings. Hence, it is also understood as the wisdom of equality, or impartiality. For the wisdom of investigative awareness that perceives the specificity, uniqueness of dharmas, this type of wisdom is also known as the wisdom of specific knowledge or sublime investigation, which means each seed, each, each uh, cough, each uh, galaxy, each leaf. Five, the wisdom of accomplishing activities the awareness that spontaneously carries out all that has to be done for the welfare of beings manifesting in all directions. Roshi used to, ca uh, Kaplo used to speak of this last as uh, uh, Wu Wei, uh, that is referencing Taoism, doing nothing, you do nothing, yet leaving nothing undone. Doing nothing, yet leaving nothing undone. This is the essence of Taoism's Wu Wei, non-doing, which obviously does not mean passivity, not doing anything, laziness, or justification for refusing to take uh, any sides and remain seated on a fence. So uh, let me just make a note here. All right. Manju Bodhisattva typically looks youthful because wisdom is always fresh and new, never old or stale. How old or stale can an experience of aha be? So he is known too as the ever youthful one and the sweet voiced one. Here at Endless Path Zendo, if you come in person, you'll see Manjushri makes a number of appearances. In our Doksan room, there's a Japanese scroll a reproduction of him on a majestic blue lion with his hair in five tuft, tufts, and he holds not a sword, but a lotus in one hand, and in the other, the scroll of wisdom, our prajna paramita, heart of perfect wisdom. All in all, it's an image of noble power. The bodhisattva prince is completely at ease riding a dharma lion, and together they're an emblem uh, of our own royal nature, as I've mentioned. In the Zendo, we have a large bronze manjushri, uh, a Chinese version of what was a Nepalese or Tibetan original, who wields a delusion-cutting sword. Uh, seated in lotus posture, a book of Prajnaparamita rises on the lotus in his left hand. Uh, nearby, there's a small wooden manju on a lion in front of the Buddha on the main altar, holding an upright sword in his right hand and a wisdom scroll in his left. Uh, this is the hair-blown sword. A Chinese porcelain monastery accompanied by two young attendants 
presides serenely over our doksan line, where you wait to come into the doksan room. He has long hair and holds a katsu, that is the teacher's stick, um, <coughs> or the imperial staff, which shows that his personal wishes are totally in accord, in accord with the wishes of the great universe itself. This is an emblem of selflessness and power. A scroll sits beside him on a lotus leaf. The waves surge beneath his feet. He is completely at ease, one leg half down, one hand resting lightly on his knee, ready to get up and be of use at a moment's notice. More generally, both Mahayana and Vajrayana, Tibetan Buddhism, include a four-armed manjushri wielding a sword and lotus and bow and arrow and also appears in female forms. In Tibet, a wonderfully monstrous blue, uh, bull-headed, dark blue, many-armed, fierce and wrathful manjushri surrounded by roaring flames is Yamantaka, slayer of death. This fiercely compassionate Manjushri is a wise Dharma protector and an enemy to all self-centeredness and evil. <coughs> so Manjushri may be shown with a book, a sword, a lion, a katsu, an imperial scepter or a lotus, all of which, when you come down to it, are signifiers of wisdom. What kind of wisdom? Sink into your practice of realization, your realization of practice into mu, into this breath, this count, this koan point, and it, ungraspable self-nature, which is no nature, may become so clear to you that you find yourself doubling over in laughter. What relief! All my accumulated worries fall away. Touching base with wisdom's fountain of youth, this dropping of body and mind, another way of saying sink into mu, will become intimate with the count or this breath. Doesn't mean falling into some spiritual mayonnaise in which different ingredients become one big mush. If it's all one, what about ants and eagles, stars and snails, Hangnails and nine-inch nails, Beatles and Beethoven. Emptiness doesn't replace them. Manju is not a savant. He needs a manual. He needs to read it. He needs to read a manual to fix the carburetor or restart his Kindle. Manjushri's penetrating wisdom reveals vast emptiness as the individual uniqueness of each ant, leaf, galaxy, person, or snowflake. What is it then to be a devotee of Manjushri? Personally, I like having him or her around and find it encouraging to see and be reminded of Manju's living presence as I encounter these forms in our zendo. An introductory koan asks, what is the age of Manjushri this year? <coughs> so he's never far away from the core of our practice. Manju functions wisely, not only in the silence of the Zendo, but out in our bustling world of 10,000 things, among clouds, stars, bugs, people, eyeglasses, cell phones, crayons, thumbtacks, cars, computers, iPads, mountains, and rivers. When he appears on his noble lion and swings his delusion-cutting sword, my tree is cut down. My child is gone. Instead, I encounter my tree my child. Even the great layman Vimala Kirti with his possessions, workers, family, furniture, jewels and horses has only a bare empty room when Manjushri comes to ver for a visit. Then again, if Manju is so wise, why in the koan of their encounter, uh, uh, there's a koan of Vimala Kirti uh, and Manjushri, it's uh, case 84, Heke Genroku, Vimalakirti's gate of, of non-duality. Why, when they meet, does the old layman seem to put the bodhisattva of wisdom himself to shame? Or is Manjushri actually being extra skillful and acting as a foil, letting Vimalakirti take center stage and put on 
this great show. The case goes, part of it goes, Vimalakirti asked Manjushri, what is the Bodhisattva's Dharma gate of non-duality? Manjushri answered, to my mind, in all dharmas, there are no words, no preaching, no demonstration, and no recognition. It is beyond all questions and answers. That is entering the Dharma gate of non-duality. Then Manjushri asked Vimalakirti, who was a very wealthy layman, who was said to be as realized as the Buddha himself. Manjushri says to Vimalakirti, each of us has had a say. Uh, now tell us, good man, because there are a number of uh, bodhisattvas who've come with Manjushri to check on Vimalakirti, who's lying on a sickbed. Each of us has had his say. Now tell us, good man, what is the bodhisattva's entry into the Dharma gate of non-duality? Isn't that a crucial question for each of us? What is the bodhisattva's entrance into the Dharma gate of non-duality? Isn't this the central point of our practice? Isn't this what we're working to realize more and more deeply? Shwedo, uh, who is the original compiler of Blue Cliff Record, uh, put together the cases and the verses, commented saying, what did Vimalakirti say? And again, he says, I have seen through him. Oh, I have seen through him. Yamada Roshi adds, it had said that 32 people had accompanied Manjushri on his visit and that each of them had presented his view, uh, uh, sorry for the gender-laden language, their view on what was involved in entering the bodhisattvas, entering the Dharma gate of non-duality. The last to speak was Manjushri. He then asked Vimalakirti to offer his view. Nothing more appears in the koan about how Vimalakirti answered in the Vimalakirti Sutra, however, it says that Vimalakirti just sat there in silence. That was his answer. Then Shwedo asks us, what did Vimalakirti say? The Vimalakirti Sutra also says that Vimalakirti's silence was like thunder. In his silence, Vimalakirti presents the entire universe. Does your silence present the entire universe? Roshi Kapo used to, he loved quips, and he uh, used to say, silence can be golden, but it can also be chicken. Silence can be golden, but it can also be chicken. Vimalakirti's silence was like thunder. He presents the entire universe. With this question, uh, Shwedo shows how he is aware that Vimalakirti is perfectly expressing the world of oneness. Shwedo's verse to the case goes like this. Uh, Shwedo would be Secho in Japanese. Hey, this old Vimalakirti, feeling sorry for sentient beings, he suffers in vain. He is, was lying ill in Vaisali, that's his city, and his entire body was extremely wasted and thin. Yes, extremely wasted and thin. How thin? Ah, the teacher of the seven Buddhas came. The single room had been swept free of all dust. He asked about the gate of non-duality. At that time, he then leaned upon Vimalakirti. In other words, he's putting pressure on the old sick guy to say something. But he was not pushed down. There is no place to find the golden-haired lion. There is no place to find the golden-haired lion. From the perspective of non-duality, of prajna, of vast, empty of self-centeredness wi wisdom, of manjushri, him or herself, we do not even possess eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind, color, sound, smell, taste, touch, or what the mind takes hold of. No mind nothing to gain, and no one to gain or lose a thing, no wisdom to attain, no lion to ride, no sword to swing, and no one to do the riding or wield the keen weapon. This has nothing to do with ignorance <coughs> or anti-intellectualism. Not this, not that. No clinging, nothing to cling to. 
and no one to do the clinging. The flaming sword cuts, the lion leaps. <clears throat> and the always present wisdom reveals itself. How can you attain what you already have? Who is there to be or become wise? Does this sound intense or even scary? I mean, who am I? It can be a very scary question for some people, but really it's no more so than seeing a golden sunrise or a star-filled night and awed we forget ourselves. Being selfless is not losing a thing. It's coming home. The world steps in and is our entire body. Sometimes our habitual silliness, our resistance and efforts to maintain self-centeredness can be so misguided, they are just sad. Clinging to thoughts of me, myself, and I never seems to bring the joy or security we hope for by doing it. Aren't our best moments those in which we forgot ourselves and our child walked in? The sunset walked in, the mountain walked in, the taste of a cup of tea was ourselves. Zen simply helps us live such a self-forgotten, ordinary life. This is wisdom. This is Manjushri. Dogen says that to move the self forward to become one with the 10,000 things is called delusion. But to let the 10,000 things realize themselves as the self is intimacy or realization. The 10,000 things no longer stand out there as threatening or desirable. We are intimate with things as they are. Nothing is a stranger. We sit by the glowing coals of our own hearth. The Prajna Paramita Radaya, heart of perfect wisdom, speaks of the Bodhisattva of compassion. This is, means Manjushri, that's what they're, it's talking about, or Kanon. But Manjushri loves the heart of perfect wisdom, for it is her own heart. Know then, form is only emptiness, emptiness only form. Form is no other than emptiness. Emptiness no other than form. Feeling, thought, and choice, consciousness itself are the same as this. Dharmas here are empty. All are the primal void. None are born or die, nor are they stained or pure, nor do they wax or wane. So in emptiness, no form, no feeling, thought, or choice, nor is there Consciousness, no eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind, no color, sound, smell, taste, touch, or what the mind takes hold of, nor, nor even act of sensing, no ignorance or end of it, nor all that comes of ignorance, no withering, no death, no end of them, nor is there pain or cause of pain or ceasing pain or noble path to lead from pain, not even wisdom to attain. Attainment, too, is emptiness. Perfect wisdom is revealed or uncovered. It is not added to us and cannot be gained. The sort of practice cuts through old habits of delusive, self-centered thinking, allowing the wisdom that has always been to appear, seeing colors with the eyes, hearing sounds with the ears, thinking thoughts with the brain, no additional effort is required. We do not climb a ladder of thought to get to this. It is ours before the first rung of the ladder of thinking begins. It is what the ladder stands on. Still, when you get your head through this gateless gate, do you think you'll actually see Manjushri riding a lion? In ancient China, a noted teacher saw Manjushri appear to him in the steam rising from the pot of rice he was cooking. He hit it, he hit at it with his wooden spoon to drive it away. This is surely Manjushri attending properly 
to Manjushri. Get away! Get away! With a swing of his or her sword, Manjushri banishes relative realities. That is, takes away things seen only in comparison or in relation to one another. This is the so-called relative world. It vanishes when Manjushri's sword cuts in one. Each thing then is itself no longer seen only relatively. Mount Wutai, the mountain in China sacred to Manjushri, is seen as a realm of gold for their everything. Just as it is, is supremely valuable. An apple not less than a diamond. With nothing to judge one in relation to the other, each can be fully what it is. Profound equality is Manjushri's nature. The Japanese monk Enin made the difficult sea voyage to China in 838 and while there made a pilgrimage to Wutai Shan or Mount Wutai, the five peak mountain sacred to the Bodhisattva of wisdom. And it's seen as his home on this earth. Enin was so moved by his experiences, he brought the cult of Manjushri back to Japan with him when he returned in 847. Shan is still sacred today and one of the oldest still sacred religious sites in the world. Uh, by the way, in the 1700s, it became a very rich site of pilgrimage and teaching for Tibetan Buddhists, uh, as well as the Buddhism of the Manchus and Mongolians. And that's really where its practice is centered right now, Tibetan, uh, Tibetan communities up on Mount Wutai. Enin saw wonders at Mutai Shan and wrote of, get this, balls of light that moved intelligently and purposefully among the five peaks, and how pilgrims gathered to see them and pay homage. Interestingly, Ray Bradbury, in his seminal science fiction work, The Martian Chronicles, wrote of ancient Martians who, having long ago transcended all physical matter, appeared as such balls of light to Christian missionaries who'd come to Mars to convert the aliens to true religion. Instead, meeting with these balls of luminous light, they were awed into humility. And it wrote a vegetarian feast offered on Mount Wutai, not just to monks, but to ordinary pilgrims, including women and children. And that's a rarity in the old monastic Buddhist world. And why did they do it? Because, get this, years earlier, a pregnant woman at such a feast demanded double portions, one for herself and one for her unborn child. Refused, she rose into the air, became the Bodhisattva Manjushri, and vanished in a blaze of light. After that, all guests were welcomed equally, regardless of social or monastic standing. And in wrote admiringly too that on the sacred mountain of Manjushri, Bodhisattva of Wisdom, no one dared treat any person or animal harshly. Rather, each was treated with loving care. Why? Because you never knew. But even that poor donkey over there under its load of firewood could be Manjushri in one of his many forms. So an atmosphere of equality and loving kindness suffused and characterized all that happened on the five peaked mountain. We mature from where we are, from within our circumstances, not by running from them. Lay practice is authentic practice. The sutra on the Upasaka precepts, that is the sutra on and about lay precepts, and there's a whole sutra on it, says that because lay practice is so difficult, uh, <clears throat> with so many issues of family and relationship and finance and environment and uh, government and culture, that when a lay person arouses the aspiration for enlightenment and works at it, here's the quote from the sutra, the four heavenly kings and also the kings of the Askanith, Akanista and other heavens pleasantly and with great surprise exclaim, now we have a teacher of men 
and gods. That's what the gods say when a lay person rouses the desire, the aspiration for enlightenment. The cult of Manjushri was important to lay practitioners in Tong era China, as it was in Japan after Enin brought it there. Who needs wisdom more than lay people? We face complex issues every day, issues of power, of environment, of work, of medicine, along with the caring tasks of responsible citizenry and family, all while doing our best to maintain a functioning Zen practice of dropping the self, the self-centered self. By its nature, lay life demands wisdom. Lay practitioners are never off the hook, never. In Zen, intimacy and enlightenment mean the same thing. Practicing to get enlightened is misleading. Can you get intimacy? Through practice, we mature by seeing through habits of unenlightenment. Manju's lion roars, lotus with the book of wisdom blossoms. Uh, by sidelined, uh, side comment. Why a lotus? A lotus rises out of mud, keeps going through murky water, finally emerges into air and sunlight and fully opens and blooms. So this is a very ancient model of life's journey from ignorance to fulfillment. The fundamental delusion of the world is duality, separation, alienation, me in here, you out there. When Manju's sword cuts, that's all gone. Practicing this, this, this breath, this koan, is how we use that sword. It is for lack of intimacy that we stumble through life as if we were mere tourists, polluting the air, killing the plants and animals that are our own ancestors and cousins, warring against brothers and sisters, causing ourselves and others sorrow and pain. All because we do not know how to use our own mind are not intimate with our own nature, have so little awareness of our own genuine wisdom. How many sorrows litter the trail of human history. Zen practice is a corrective, realization, a way of becoming ordinary in the best sense. Manjushri is our ally, our patron, our guide, we bow in gratitude that he has compassionately taken form in response to our need. The fading of the root of self-centeredness that comes through putting our attention on this count, this breath, this koan, is the blossoming of the lotus, the reading of the scroll, the riding of the lion, the swinging of the sword. It is a unified teaching. The sword of cutting is the flower of blossoming, is the awakening of wisdom, is the uncovering of, innate, uncovering of innate courage and fearlessness. Practice is enlightenment. Enlightenment is practice. Practice is not a technique to become enlightened. The sword that kills delusions and separation is the sword that returns us to budding, blossoming life. The word Buddha may itself stem from the same root as the word to bud. Life is not only practice, but practice is life. Manju's life work of ending delusion is joyous and healing, for it is the work of uncovering the mystery of who and what we already are, riding our lion we rise off the sitting mat and head out of the zendo, embodying fundamental wisdom in the world of activity. When we thought what we thought would be toil turns out to be the higher state that we prosaically term play. So as we have a few minutes 
And as our final word of this Teisho uh, was play, I'd like to now turn us to Ikenoshi in a very short uh, piece on play from uh, Original Dwelling Place, which we've also been uh, reading and commenting. And we should end at the regular time, so uh, I hope you'll indulge me because this is so much fun uh, to read Ikenoshi on play. Lin Ji asked Wang Ho, what is the clearly mas manifested essence of the Buddha Dharma? Wang Po hit him. This happened three times. Lin Ji went then to Dayu. Dayu asked, where did you come from? Lin Ji said, from Wang Po. Dayu said, what does Wang Po have to say? Lin Ji said, I asked him three times, what is the clearly manifested, manifested essence of the Buddha Dharma? And he hit me three times. I don't know whether I was at fault or not. Dayu said, Wang Po is such an old grandmother. He completely exhausted himself for your sake. And you come here asking whether or not you were at fault. With this, Lin Ji had great realization and exclaimed, ah, there is not so much to Wang Po's Buddha Dharma. Dayu grabbed hold of Lin Ji and said, you dead wedding little devil. You just finished asking whether you were at fault or not, and now you say there isn't so much to Wang Po's Buddha Dharma. What did you just realize? Speak, speak. Lin Ji jabbed Da Yu in the side three times. Shoving him away, Da Yu said, Wang Po is your teacher. It's not my business. Uh -huh. A lot can be said about this case, says Aitken Roshi, but I just want to take up a single point. How much is not so much? How is that not so much? How is it that not so much gave rise to such a vigorous tradition that thrives to this very day? Of course, Linji, that's Rinzai in Japan, was not the only teacher on our lineage who talked about the poverty of the Buddha Dharma. The literal meaning of Jiao Chu's Mu uh, means no or not, points to the same fact. Yet according to the Book of Serenity, uh, Shoyoroku, the monk went on to ask Chao Chu, all beings have Buddha nature. How is it that the dog has none? Chao Chu said, because of its inherent karma. Karma and Buddha nature, the substantial teaching of all the Buddhas and its empty content, these sets of relative and absolute, universe and void, are one in our play as Zen students. Thanks to our marvelous, marvelous heritage. Wang Bo, Dayu, Zhao Chu, and all the other great ones fooled, fooled with themes of essence and phenomena to enlighten us. One of my early Japanese teachers and I used to argue about play. His understanding of English may have been a factor. For him, play was limited to children, baseball, and theater. I understood play as the nature of interaction. Not only human action, but all of it. Puppies are more frisky than dogs, but even an old dog knows it's a game. Interaction is play because it doesn't amount to much or even to little. On your cushions, nothing impedes your interaction with thoughts. Your view, you view one thought frame after another. When your thoughts wander and you notice what has happened, then easily and smoothly you return to focusing on Mu or your breath or the count. When the bell rings for the end of the period, you bring your hands together, rock back and forth, swing around on your cushion and stand up. In the workaday world again, interaction is play. Nothing impedes your response to your child's demands. When the telephone rings, you type save on your computer, pick up the receiver and say, hello. When the bus reaches your station, you get off promptly. And he quotes a little poem, farmers sing in the fields, merchants dance at the market. Layman Pong wrote, how wonderful, how miraculous. I draw water, I carry kindling. How wonderful, how marvelous. I drive to the store and buy groceries. How wonderful, how marvelous. I turn on the computer and see a bunch of people sitting in their home zendos. When Joanna Macy and I, it's Aiken Roshi speaking, spoke at a Buddhist Peace Fellowship meeting, we were challenged from the back of the 
called by a group of evangelical Buddhists. Are you surprised that there could be evangelical Buddhists? Evangelism is a character trait and is not limited to any particular religion. These people were born again Buddhists, firmly convinced that Dharma and Karma are entities with certain fixed qualities and tendencies. Joanna and I told them, each in our own way, that no concept is solid or absolute, and that even Buddha self-destructs, their Dharma was not ours. They became, and became angry because they didn't know our interaction was play, an inning in the joyous game of time and space, giving and taking with empty, universal nature. All the world, world's a stage. We play roles, Zen teacher, Zen student, parent, spouse, friend, worker, pedestrian, and so on. We play as if, to use the Hindu term, as if we were Zen teacher, student, parent, and so on. The child plays house as if, as if she were a mother. The mother plays house in exactly the same way. He himself took the jar and bought wine in the village and now dons a robe and makes himself the host. That's an old poem, Chinese poem. And the, when the play doesn't make you laugh, that doesn't mean it isn't play anymore. Tragedy is play too. Tragic to the very bottom, perhaps, but still play. The Night of the Burning Pestle by Francis Beaumont, uh, this is a Renaissance, early Renaissance play, taught me that the audience creates the play and the play is not confined to the stage. A druggist and his wife are patrons of the theater and she doesn't like the way the play begins. She stands up, this is the old, this old play. She stands up in the audience and starts directing things. Her paramour, the druggist's apprentice, is introduced as a new character, the Knight of the Burning Pestle, with a pestle in flames inscribed as a crest on his shield. We then have a new play and the separation between audience and actors is broken down. The inner fantasy of the druggist's wife is acted out on stage and thus inner and outer too lose their barrier. This is only possible because matter is insubstantial and there is not a speck of anything to interfere with our complete interpenetration. In the world of play, a druggist apprentice becomes a knight, a child becomes a father, a dog becomes a baby, and the insurance agent throwing off his worries about declining sales transforms himself into a prince and seduces his tired wife and the mother of his brood, who in turn becomes a ravishing masked beauty at a mummer's ball. Uh, this is an introductory koan, he then quotes, in a well that has not been dug, water from a spring that does not flow is rippling. Someone with no shadow or form is drawing the water. This is Zen play. Where is the person with no shadow or form. On the stage of the interview room, that is the doksan room, you dance your response. That person with no shadow or form inhabits a dream world that is no other than this world. Traditional people confirmed their dreams in this world with ceremonies and then re-entered the dream world again by reenacting their ceremonies. We do the same with our ceremonies as we'll do uh, next Saturday with our ceremony for the Buddhist party Nirvana. We dedicate the merit of reciting our sutras to our ancestors in the Dharma and to our parents and grandparents parents who have died. Are they listening? Of course they are. Nakagawa Soen Roshi once exclaimed, of course there are bodhisattvas and angels living up in the sky. This is all possible because there, are, there is not much to Wang Bo's Buddha Dharma or to anyone else's for that matter. And as to the Buddha nature of the dog or of you or me, so we'll stop here. Uh, I will turn the computer around. I'll stop the recording and we will recite together facing uh, the altar our great vows for all 
Uh, thanks so much for coming this morning. It was fun to be able to share some Dharma with you. Uh, please stay well and take care. So we'll stop the recording and we'll do our great vows uh, for all. <laughs>